Hey, welcome back, Sergio here. This is the third part in the Nikon SB910 series, and we're talking about non TTL auto flash. Last time, we spoke about the two TTL modes and then tested them out. And in the video before that, which is the first one in the series, we spoke about manual mode, GN mode, um, manual flash theory, batteries, um, the overall specs of the, of the speed light, and then we tested everything out. Now, today we're going to be doing exactly that, but with on-camera non-TTL auto flash. Now, there's going to be a separate video that covers all the off-camera stuff. So without further ado, let's have a look. Let me read out what I've learned about the auto modes. The variety of technology featured in the 910 is substantial. Auto flash has been introduced during the 20th century and the Nikon SB910 supports all the different types of non-TTL auto flash. There are two systems of auto flash built into this speed light, both of which actually make use of modern IGBT technology that offers fast operation and power recycling and the light sensor built into the 910. You can read about the benefits of IGBT online. The two auto systems are called auto flash with monitor flashes and auto flash without monitor flashes. Both can be used with auto aperture updating, in which case they are called auto aperture mode without monitor flashes and auto aperture mode with monitor flashes. Let's talk about auto flash without monitor flashes. Now this technology has been introduced during the 20th century. And while the modern version improves upon the original releases, it basically works in the same way. In order to calculate the correct output, the speed light needs to know your ISO and aperture, which are usually automatically communicated through the hot shoe. We spoke about the relationship between ISO, aperture and flash power in the first video. Then, as the camera triggers it, it will fire a flash. While the xenon tube is on, the speed light will use its built-in sensor to measure the reflections coming back at it as the tube becomes brighter. Once the reflections add up to whatever values will result in a final image that averages to mid-tone, the xenon tube will be turned off. Obviously, this happens incredibly fast, so it appears to be simply just a light burst to the naked eye. You may choose whether you want to manually update the aperture or allow the 910 to automatically update it as you make changes on your camera. The benefits of this system include backwards compatibility with many older cameras. As long as it can trigger the flash and the speed light knows your exposure, it takes care of everything else by itself. The drawbacks include not being able to shoot at uh, shutter speeds higher than the sync speed due to the fact that the output value needs to be calculated while the xenon tube is on, and high speed sync requires the xenon tube to be strobed in order to appear as a continuous source while the shutter curtains slide across the sensor. Now let's talk about auto flash with monitor flashes. This system builds upon the older system by using a monitor flash in order to separate the measurement into its own event. Similar to the other auto system, you may choose whether you want the uh, speed light to update your aperture automatically or not. Once you have your ISO and aperture information, you may fire a monitor flash with that VLOG for measurements or simply just take a shot like you normally would and the monitor flash will be fired automatically before the main flash just like TTL. Remember that this is not TTL. The speed light uses its own built-in sensor for this. The main flash is being fired so that the resulting image averages to mid-tone. The fact that the measurements are now done separately from the main flash enables higher accuracy since firing, measuring and turning off all at once in a tiny fraction of a second can be a bit difficult and may cause the brightness of the flash to be slightly different than it should have been. But most importantly, the speed light already knows how bright to fire the main flash, so strobing for high speed sync can now be enabled on the main flash. Using auto system with monitor flashes thus enables FV lock, high speed sync and higher accuracy, but the drawback is limited compatibility with all the cameras. Well that's it as far as it goes um, for the specs this time. I've put it all to the test and I've done exactly what I've done last time, I've got all the pictures in the camera. But first let's have a look at the controls 
and the sensor. The light sensor used by the auto modes is located here at the front. It is very important to be careful not to cover the sensor or making sure that there is no foreign object obstructing it. If you can't see the reflections, it will cause the speed light to overexpose. Accessing the auto modes is done by pressing the mode button and then scrolling until you see the letter A displayed at the top. Chances are it will be displayed together with a few other symbols. In this case, the flash symbols tell us that the monitor flashes are enabled and the aperture symbol tells us that the um, aperture is being automatically updated so we are now in auto aperture mode with monitor flashes and high speed sync enabled. As you can see all exposure information is being updated automatically. In order to switch between the auto modes you need to go into the menu and access the very first tab labeled capital A. We have four options auto aperture mode with monitor flashes, auto aperture without monitor flashes, auto with monitor flashes and auto without monitor flashes. This is the only menu tab that we haven't covered yet in the other videos that is relevant to using auto mode in the hot shoe or through a TTL cable. Now let's choose auto mode without monitor flashes. As you can see choosing an option without monitor flashes will automatically disable high speed sync. Once again, this is auto mode without monitor flashes, so it ignores the aperture, but as you can see, all the other exposure information is automatically being updated. The screen also shows you the effective flash to subject distance, much like in the other modes. However, this will disappear if you're bouncing, but it's still worth having a look at before you're bouncing, so you'll have a better idea where to point the flash. As far as the function buttons are concerned, we already covered the zoom function, and the next button up is the flash compensation, which is the same as before. And the third button does not show you anything unless you are in non-aperture auto mode, like so. As now you are required to dial in the aperture values manually. And lastly, the test fire button is perhaps the most relevant to auto mode because it will allow you to test fire your exposure based on your settings and bouncing position and measure it as it is before you're taking the shot. If there's a problem it will blink and the flash indicator inside the viewfinder will do the same. This warning is also active when FV lock is being used. That's it for the screen, there's nothing else being displayed that we haven't covered already. Now let's have a look at the pictures and see how they compare to the, um, to the specs. Now I got the same setup like last time with the speed light in the hot shoe and the uh, HDMI output being um, recorded by the computer only I used the 50mm um, f1.8D prime lens uh, this time I shot in black and white once again because we're looking for tone uh, now since the speed light is doing its own measurements I can't depend on the lens to isolate the light for the test so I had to physically isolate the flash by firing it into a corner and uh, it, you know in order to test for the mid-tone the wall was wide, so I'm looking for a mid-grade picture. I also tested out how much of a difference the monitor flashes are making as far as accuracy is concerned. So basically, let's just have a look. So this is the first picture, I shot 10 pictures. And this is with monitor flashes and pointing at the wall. Now as you can see, that looks mid-grade, which is good. So that tested out about right. And this is the same wall but without monitor flashes. And it seems to have been a bit brighter, but not much. Now this is a door and a wall. This is with monitor flashes and once again everything is mid-grey as expected. And this is without monitor flashes. So the I, I seem to, to be able to see exactly the same thing no matter where I shoot. Um, if I use monitor flashes it's not quite as bright, but closer to mid-tone than without monitor flashes, so that tests out about correct. Now here I've added some um, some contrast basically so this is with monitor flashes and this is without. Now the difference is a bit less obvious but you can see it in the wall there with monitor flashes without. Next up I moved back a bit because as you can see here this is with monitor flashes and this is without 
So as you can see here, the difference becomes less obvious when there's more stuff, when basically the reflections spread out. So with monitor flashes, without. And then I bounced it, this is bounce, this is with monitor flashes, and without. And the difference is even less obvious now. With, without. Yeah, that looks about right. And also, um, that's it for the tests. Because, you know, it's literally just only looking at reflections. It doesn't know where the subject is or um, which reflections represent the subject. It just fires a flash and reads the reflections. Now, luckily, it's a simple, straightforward system. Now, I like the auto modes. I like the idea of firing out and not trying to isolate anything. It makes for a great main light. Now, I mean, as long as the sensor is able to see what the flash head is doing, it will do its best to give you a standard level lighting, as they say, um, and it's doing a great job. Now, it's not afraid to fire at, you know, at, full, at, at full power if need be, but there may be some drawbacks. I mean, for instance, if you have a bright light shining into the sensor, even if it's not sunlight, it will underexpose slightly. Now, if you have a mod that's reflecting a lot of light from the flash or, or monitor flash back into the sensor, it will underexpose, you know. If, um, if your scene has a lot of bright objects against a single darker subject, for example, once again, it may underexpose. But in, in my experience, it's not, it's not a dramatic difference. Um, it's things like that because, you know, no isolation of the reflections is being performed at all. And it doesn't know where in space the subject is. You know, it, it, it doesn't know anything at all, really. It just It's just looking at scene reflections, that's it. Now, there's not a lot to think about, but still, uh, there's a, a bunch of things that, uh, you know, you should keep in mind, I think. These minuses may uh, turn out to work for you in some situations, such as Phil. I mean, depending on where the sensor is facing, maybe some sunlight is making its way into it. Now, obviously, don't um, make, uh, don't point your camera at the sun. Uh, it should be facing, uh, but the sensor should be facing in the same direction as the lens is facing, obviously, especially if you're using a TTL cable. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's a bulletproof technology. It's been around for decades, you know, people love it. And uh, it's uh, simple and divine, as they say. Well, that's it for today. Um, it's really not that long of, of a video because it's an easy mode to explain, you know, it's not overly complicated like TTL. And, um, yeah, I'll see you when I see you next, which is, I don't know when I'm going to be able to update, to upload the next video, because I'm starting work, but uh, it'll be about the um, uh, the repeating flash, so, yeah, I'll see you then, bye-bye.